politics from the left side of things. Have y'all recovered from your debate hangover? <laughs> I, I just want to know to all the listeners out there, have you recovered from your debate hangover? That was an it show. And y'all know it was an it show. There was nothing positive about it. There's there's nothing to take away from that because even Biden had to tell somebody to shut up. That's how bad it was. When Joe, sweet, sleepy, look, he's supposed to be Sleepy Joe, but apparently Sleepy woke up and was like, I'm going to need you to shut up. That was terrible. Please, if you had children that watched that, please tell them that that's not how real adults conduct themselves. <laughs> We and 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 we definitely as politicians out here are not uh, behaving in such an abhorrent behavior. Um, and I, I made it a point to only sip on water that night because I had a feeling if I had started to drink. Anyway, so let's just let's all just wash that out of our memories. We're gonna wash that out of our memories. All right, debate bad, Trump bad, Biden eh. And let's just let all of that go, okay? But I want to share some information with you all. So today, this is important. Today, the Texas governor, Greg Abbott, issued a proclamation where he is limiting ballot drop-off boxes to one per county. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Texas. I've been to Texas. I've been to a few counties in Texas, and ain't none of them small. I think every county is essentially the same size as Indiana. (laughs) That's how big Texas is. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, he wants to tell people that this is about protecting the security of the ballots. Now, they hadn't had any real voter fraud up to now. Why all of a sudden they got to do that? But the Democratic Party chair, um, Gilberto, Hinosa says, this is blatant voter suppression. That's all it is. Because see, now what you've done is made it difficult for people who have transportation issues, who have other kind of whatever issues it is to try to figure out how they're going to drop that ballot off. Again, it just makes it harder for people to vote. And that's not what our democracy is about. Our democracy is about making it easier and more accessible for people to vote. So let me tell you what happened in Indiana. I actually have some good news for us. Some really good news. Uh, A judge blocked the law that declares that ballots received after uh, 12 p.m. on election day would be marked invalid. So that for the November 3rd election, if your ballot is received, because you know, you know, the joy is just like, destroying the oldest institution in the, in America, which is the postal service. I mean, revolutionary war people were able to send mail. He has completely destroyed it. The judge said, no, 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 no. If those ballots are late, you're counting them. So that's, that is a good, good thing for us in Indiana. Something else that we need to think about. That was good. The seventh, uh, uh, circuit judge is also, Going to re- they're going to uh, the Seventh Circuit Court is going to hear oral arguments on whether or not no uh, no excuse absentee ballots can be accepted, and they're going to hear that on Wednesday. So depending on how that ruling goes, it is a possibility that there's a no absentee ballot. If you haven't already requested your ballots, you you might want to hurry up and get that done, right? Um, and then there was another ruling that said, uh, that talked about who, and this one's really, really important. And I want you guys to listen to this one. This one is about who can make a request to extend the polling hours. So say for example, you get to your polling place and at at six o'clock, um, because you're trying to go in before work or whatever the case may be, and you anticipated a long line. And for some reason that polling place is not open. Well, as of right now, you have to go seek out a judge which I don't know if you know it, most judges in the state state of Indiana take election day off because it's essentially one of those days where most governments shut down, right? They take the day off. You have to go find a judge that'll sign an affidavit to say, yeah, you can extend polling places. So there was a ruling that changed who can make that request because you got to find the right person to make the request to the judge. So in Indiana, at least, we're seeing some progress 
on how we can cast our ballots, especially by mail, especially absentee balloting, um, even though the Republicans in the state of Indiana are trying to do everything they can to make you choose between your health and your civic duty. They've done everything they can. But luckily, with Common Cause and a lot of the other organizations around the state, a lot around the country, we even had some help from Chicago, uh, uh, we are loosening up those restrictions and making sure that people have an opportunity to cast their vote, all right? So I wanted to share that with you because that, that's good, good, good stuff. Um, considering that there's a governor in Texas, the largest state in the union, they got about 100 counties, but there's only one ballot box, one drop-off ballot location per county. Holcomb better not try that. He better not. He, I, man, look, I know where his house at. It's around the corner from mine. I know where it's at. <laughs> Yo, so that's some good news. All right. Yo, you know me. I love talking to these candidates that have sacrificed time away from their family and friends that want to be out here running for office. And I got, I got an incumbent and I got a challenger. I love these kind of conversations because this is where the, incum the incumbent can school the challenger and on how the challenger can win. And then the, ch the incumbent can learn from what the challenger's hearing out in the field. These are great conversations. First up, I want, now, Robin Shackelford is the truth. First of all, she's a, she's a North Central grad. I just want to put that out there. You know what I'm saying? Panthers, if when you're a Panther, it just, it just does something to your spirit. You know what I'm saying? You just, you know, you, something with your spirit. Y'all, welcome to, for the first time to my show, incumbent, running in District 98, Representative Robin Shackelford. Robin, welcome to Turn Left. Yes, I made it to the <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited. And, of course, we have a challenger who is doing the work. I see his little messages all over the place since we've been friends. I've been seeing his messages, his posts. He's doing the social media thing. You notice COVID is restricting how we can campaign, but I see his work. Um, he's getting, like, kudos from some folks that I know, so I know he's putting in the work. Y'all give it up for Mike Andrade, who is running in House District 14. Uh, Mike, how bad did I screw up your last name? So you said my last name right, but it's District 12, what? What? and I don't have a challenger. Um, the current state rep, Mara Candelara Reardon, decided to retire. That's right. So I'm I am sorry. actually running as a first-timer, and uh, I only have uh, an opponent from the Republican side. Well, that, that's okay, so it's an open seat. It's an open seat. That is correct. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. That means you're going to wrap this up in no time. This, that race, all these races are over. All these races are over. So if, as you're listening today, and if there's something that you hear from either one of these folks and you like what they're talking about, guess what you can do on that side? Click the link. Their donation link buttons are right there. You don't have to go search for it. It's right there. So if you like what they're talking about and what they want to work on, donate to their campaigns because we got to get folks elected. First up, I'm going to go ahead and do it ladies first. Robin, tell the people who you are and where you come from. So I'm State Representative Robin Shackelford. I reside here on the east side and the far east side of Indianapolis, House District 98. I've been in the House since 2012. I'm born and raised in Indianapolis, the inner city, uh, before we moved out to the suburbs when I was in high school. So IPS schools uh, all the way up to high school, yay addicts. But uh, I went to IU uh, for my undergrad in public affairs and then IUPUI for my master's uh, here in the city in policy analysis. So I am just excited to be here. I think everybody, if you look at my legislation that I push, I'm for trying to help the community, whether it has to do with jobs, health care. Uh, right now, we're really working on a justice reform, which I'll, I'm sure we'll talk about later. Absolutely. The committees that I serve on in the House is financial institutions, government reform, and then I'm the ranking member on public health. So just happy to be here. So tell us, uh, you don't get off that easy. So what, what was it about, you know, growing up, uh, first going to Attics and then, you know, um, and then making your way up to Washington Township? Um, what, what happened in that space of time that made you consider going into public service? 
So I got to see firsthand, especially coming from IPS, uh, in particular addicts, then transferring to Washington Township, the disparities, the education disparities between what we had at addicts, what we didn't have, supplies, computers, um, a lot of stuff, from the food to everything. And then when you go to North Central, it was almost like walking into a mansion, coming from like a small house and going into a mansion. I mean, I was in orchestra at Attics. We would literally spend like the whole time tuning our instruments in this little room. You go to North Central, uh, they had a former um, person that was in the Indiana Symphony, a big old room where we were practicing with our instruments. All the way from, we had one computer lab in Attics that we would have to rotate to go in with a lot of time the computers didn't work, it was cold. Then you go to North Central where there's a whole career center, multiple computer labs, all the way from gym, you get to pick what you want to participate in, like tennis and golf. And at Addicts, we had basketball, dodgeball, and track. That was pretty much like the three things we worked out every day, working in the gym or either outside on the track. So looking at the disparities, whether it was education, our health, the lack of health services that we had in the inner city, that is what made me truly want to go into looking into policies and how can I change my community. That is so significant because there's there's a lot of defunding happening with our public school systems. Now, yes, there is a huge disparity and we knew it. Um, I, I went to Nora, Northview, North Central, so I had been in Washington Township the whole time. But we used to go over to like, you know, Arlington for summer school because we knew we could go to go there and summer school was going to be super easy. Uh, and I had I've always had a problem with that. It was like, why? You know, why, why should one school system have um, so much more than another school system when all of our children have to learn? Mm -hmm. Exactly. The disparities, and they still continue. My district, I have a very diverse uh, education system. So I have traditional public schools here with IPS. I have Warren Township mm -hmm. and then private school and also charter schools. So when I go visit the different schools, I usually go every two years during the budget year just to see what their needs are, to talk to them. There's still a disparity. You can go over to Warren. Everybody has one-to-one -one laptops, one-to-one -one computers. There's enough Wi-Fi, enough corporate sponsors helping out. And then you'll go to an IPS school where there's, once again, that one computer lab, no Wi-Fi to cover the whole building, a lack of nurses to help the kids and take their medicines. So just continuing, I know IPS has done a great job now reaching out with those corporate sponsors. And because of COVID, a lot of them have donated so kids can have one-to-one -one computers. But there's so many other disparities that just need to be closed. You're talking about educating kids. You don't want this child over here to have the ability to look on the internet. I was in a classroom and they asked the elementary schools to look up to where they would want to visit one day. And they're Googling, they're looking at different countries, they're all over the place. Well, then if you go to IPS and ask that same student who probably hasn't been too much far from their neighborhood and they're working off worksheets, they just don't have the resources to even think and dream that big. So it really matters in the classroom that you're giving them those tools and resources so their imaginations can expand and be able to dream like, yeah, one day I want to go to Dubai or I want to go any other country just to visit. I want to go to Paris and do this. Mm -hmm. So you can really see the drastic disparities in the school system. That's a shame. We would, I mean, the idea of stifling imagination, that's just, that's just, and not cultivating. That's just kind of crazy. Mike, yeah. tell the people who you are and where you come from. Well, as you know, I'm Mike Andrade, and I'm running as your next state representative for District 12. And I'm excited about this opportunity because, as you know, Dana and I represent the Shackle for we need good leadership more than ever. And we need good representation. Uh, we need to continue to have good minority representation. We need a seat on the table. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the many reasons why I decided to run for this office is open seat. And uh, born and raised in Chicago, grew up very poor in Pilsen. I started working at a very young age, at the age of 11, and I started passing pizza flyers and selling Chicago Tribune newspapers. Buy your Chicago Tribune newspaper, 
for a dollar fifty and get the weekends off special. And I still remember, and I was out there hustling, working hard to make ends meet because we grew up very poor in a two bedroom apartment with four brothers, a sister, my mom and dad. Wow. And uh, a first generation here in this uh, amazing country that we have, and we work hard to make a name ourselves here. Uh, my mom and dad came as immigrants from Mexico to this country. And back then they didn't have the resources that a lot of people nowadays have. So it was hard for them to get work because they were not legal here in this country. And they treated, I mean, we get treated bad nowadays, but back then it was, it was really bad what they had to go through. And I remember at a young age having to uh, just deal with the racism that we still face today. And it's so sad how we still deal with it. And it's 2020, we're still dealing with racism and, you know, getting called a wet bag and getting called the green card and all kinds of stuff because my parents came as immigrants and I was, uh, you know, I had an accent when I spoke in English. And, uh, and so we worked through that. You know, it's not where you start in life and it's not, uh, you know, where you begin in life and your outcome is what you do with it, right? And so I use that as a tool. I use poverty as a tool. I use growing up in, uh, in a gang infiltrated environment to survive that. And I use that as a tool for success. And I said, I'm gonna get out of it and we're gonna work hard for my life uh, two years later. And uh, 20 years ago, when I got married to Jackie, we moved into the region, what is called the region here, Northwest Indiana, Lake County area. And I've been over here in the region now. I'm a Munster resident. Been very blessed with a beautiful wife and a 16 year old son. Uh, and I'm an entrepreneur. I own two businesses, a real estate investment company, and I own a remodeling company. And uh, I am blessed. And once again, I use the tools of uh, disparity, uh, those tools of poverty, and those tools of the up, upkeeping that I came in uh, uh, from the immigration uh, system of being able to now be able to be run as your next state representative. And that's why I'm excited. I love it. I'm excited because I could make a difference. I could be a leader uh, in our community here and show people that anything can be done in life. If you put hard work into it, if you have the blessing from God and you have the support of your family. I, I, I love it. You know what? See, and that's why I'm excited about our October 3rd uh, from one, <clears throat> one to three right here on Facebook Live. We're going to have the power of the black and brown vote. Um, we're coming together with the uh, Latino caucus in the ninth district along with the uh, Monroe County uh, Black Caucus, because your story, Mike, uh, although your, your your family comes from, a, 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 you know, they're immigrants, um, they had to endure a lot of what we had to endure as black folk uh, trying to get out. The, our neighborhoods were segregated, and, and you just heard Robin talk about how, you know, the school disparities where, you know, she was in IPS and then went to, to Washington Township schools, and it was completely different. And that's why it's so important for us to work as teams um, as marginalized communities um, to, to, to uplift us because we are so powerful together. I, I agree. And that's why a couple of weeks ago, I uh, got to give a lot of credit to Representative Shackle for I met with her for lunch, went down to Indy and we almost got to see you, but I know you were busy. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Black. Yeah. And, uh, but I got to meet with Representative Shackle for, and I've been endorsed by the black caucus and it's an honor. And I, you know, represented Shaka for her leadership. I look forward to working with her downstate as a team. More than ever, we need to work together and show unity and show that we can make a difference. I love it. I love it. So, y'all, we have a lot of issues that we need to talk about. Um, first of all, uh, you guys heard me talk about how uh, the, the courts have kind of uh, lacked some of the, the um, voting restrictions that Indiana had in place. Um not as significant as we want and come next Wednesday, we'll find out whether or not no excuse absentee ballots will be accepted. Talk about how Indiana is, is not really dealing with this COVID crisis um, by requiring people to, or wanting people to literally go vote in person. And I don't care who goes first. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and go first. I'm not quite understanding uh, Indiana and Republicans, their thinking on not protecting Hoosiers as they go vote, not protecting the right to vote. It just seems we know how bad COVID is. We know what our numbers look like. We know how many have died. We know we don't have a handle on it. There's no way anytime soon that we're going to be stopping it. And we know how easy it is to catch it. It is one of those um, 
diseases or one of those virals that you get literally by standing next to someone mm -hmm. in the drip. So to say that you have to go in person to vote, you can only do an absentee ballot for just these limited number of reasons. When just in the primary, we had no absentee, uh, no excuse absentee voting. Mm -hmm. So now we're not any more further with COVID. We're not any more to a vaccine. We're not any more to a cure or anything come November. So then why would you flip and say, okay, now you can only vote by absentee ballot just for these designated re reasons. It makes no sense whatsoever. It just makes you think, what is the underlying reason that the Republicans are doing this? You know why, what it is. Uh, why wouldn't they want it more accessible to everyone to be able to vote? You're, so you, you're polite, Robin. <laughs> you're polite. You know why. They don't want you to go vote. They don't, but it's so it's so crazy that they can just sit there and be so hypocritical about the Constitution and about our rights and our liberties and constantly discuss what we should be able to do as Americans. Voting is one of the number one things we should be able to do as Americans. And anytime they are limiting that access, then I need them to stop talking about this is the land of the free and constitutional rights. I really need them to stop talking about that and saying, just come out and be truthful. No, we don't want you to vote. No, we want you to be stagnant. We want to still win. It ain't enough that we control the House and the Senate and the governor's office. We want it all. Well, I mean, you know, they following the lead from they dude at the top, lying. Mike, what are you seeing? <clears throat> I am in 100% agreement with Representative Shackelford. And the other thing is that people forget that we have a lot of senior citizens uh, who are who are sometimes don't fall under the criteria of the no excuse for absentee ballot. And so, you know, we have a lot of people who are vulnerable, uh, a lot of people who have had COVID and survived, thank God. Right. And how can you expect them to go and be required to vote in person, you know? Right. And a lot of these people out of fear might say, hey, I'm not going to go because I'm still not interacting with the public and it could hinder us votes. And so, you know, it, that's that's just totally uncalled for. Uh, but hey, what can we expect from the president down, right? And so that's what more than ever we need for us to be a voice and to express that voice and uh, and, and change. We need change to happen now. And, and uh, that's sorry. my concern. My biggest concern is people who have COVID and they don't still feel comfortable. They, they're survivors. And they still don't feel comfortable being out there in the public. And so how are you going to require them to go out there and vote in person? Because they don't uh, they don't meet the other criteria. And, our, and a lot of our senior citizens. Uh, and so you know what? And, and it's not even just voting, right, Mike? I mean, uh, Senator Bray, you know, issued essentially, I, I call it, uh, the uh, what I call it? I call it the mafia letter to the school superintendents threatening them um, to, to extort 15% of their school budget if they don't open, you know, 100% when you have at-risk students, you have at-risk teachers, and you have at-risk families. I mean, it's not even, it's almost like they don't care if we die. Yeah, when yeah. I put that letter out, I, you're taken back because you're like, there is no reason why we should make these kids come in the classroom. Parents are so scared. They don't want their kids. Some parents now they don't have the ability to be at home with their kids. So right. they're willing to send their kids in. But it should be an option. There is no way if I had kids, if I was able to be at home, I would rather stay at home. We know how kids are touchy-feely. They're touching on stuff, how easy it is for them to share germs. And they're trying to stay apart. But to send that threatening letter saying that if you don't let the kids come to school, and the thing is, we had just gotten off a call with the superintendents around the state, and they were having so many challenges. They were going down the list of challenges they were going to have with COVID and that they weren't getting clear direction from the state. Whether it was going to be how was the kids going to be spaced out riding on the bus, how would they be spaced out when they're trying to eat or being in classrooms. So, And then how long would you have to close down? Because at that point, you would have to close down and quarantine a whole school for 14 days if one person got COVID. So they had so many concerns and issues. So then to put that letter out, it just increased 
everybody fears. And now the schools are trying to scramble and say, okay, how can we have some days in, some days out, some virtual? I think it's just ridiculous that they even thought about putting out that warrant or he even thought about putting that out yeah. and not trying to work with the schools. Yeah. What say you, Mike? Well, you know, here's the other thing that you guys are putting, we're putting a lot of pressure on our teachers and for that letter to come out and say, we're, we're going to cut the funding. You know, that's one of the biggest things that I'm running on and here in, in our communities and our district 12, how we're, our teachers are so underpaid, how our public education is so under uh, resources. And, you know, my wife's a teacher mm. and I'm experiencing it firsthand where, you know, she has to wear that mask for eight hours and she's getting rashes on her left part of her face. She went to see the doctors to get some treatments on it. And then, you know, she's getting some of these uh, oil treatments on it that she puts on every night. And uh, her colleague also who's, you know, teaching as well, she's getting all these rashes on her face. And imagine those kids that have to be there wearing those masks. And she goes with K4 and K5. So they're small, you know, younger kids. And so those kids, I mean, some kids have asthma problems, you know, and as we know, kids by nature, especially at that age, uh, they like to just uh, be free about stuff. And so also having them to be like, hey, you have to wear the mask. Don't take off the mask. Right. You know, um, and wanting to touch the other kid. And, you know, they're just so used to play, being playful. They're not used to this COVID situation at that young age. And so they've never experienced anything like this. So that is also a burden on the teacher. And so it, it, it and, and for our government, uh, our, 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 our uh, state uh, governor to come out and, and everybody in the Republican Party to come out and says, we're going to cut the funding when we need it more than ever. Mm -hmm. It just shows against a lack of compassion, uh, a lack of caring about the people. You know, they're putting power and policies over people. And so it's just more deeper than just cutting funding to them. It's this is when we need it the most. Absolutely. And you're really, you're really just showing that you don't care at all. And that's what's so disheartening, right? Because, you know, people talk a good game, but they've actually demonstrated over and over again how little regard they have for Hoosiers. You know, this COVID thing is also, you know, rearing its head when it comes to health care. And, Robin, I'm going to give you a chance to really speak on it because you've been doing some amazing stuff in our state house when it comes to health care. You issued the insulin bill um, last year. You've been working on it for a couple of sessions, and I know that, where you were trying to cap the cost um, of insulin. Drove me crazy the other night to listen to Trump talk about he lowered the cost of insulin. I'm like, well, wait a second. I know a representative right in my state that's been saying, can we please cap this? And it doesn't happen. And, and talk about uh, why aren't we do, being more focused on the needs, our health care needs, especially since we don't know what, what the uh, lingering effects, all of the lingering effects of this COVID thing is going to be? Yeah, so I will, the insulin thing is a big issue. Drug costs in general and working on that all last year, trying to reduce drug costs. We'll continue to work on that for this session. Insulin is one of those drugs that's quadruple the price that shouldn't be. And it's a drug that people need to live. It's not like something optional that you have to take, but if you're prescribed that, you actually need that to live. So it's very hard when you have to make life decisions on, am I, am I gonna share this with someone else because you can't afford to get that drug. But COVID just exacerbated the needs of healthcare especially in the minority community. So the Black Caucus did ask the governor to put together a task force to look at what were some of those disparities specifically because of COVID and then what was some before COVID. So the task force got together. We came out with our report, our recommendations. We're actually going to be presenting them October the 14th during the public health committee. We're going to have about two hours to list out some of these disparities that are taking place in our minority community. And the task force did a great job because we were broken up in like nine committees dealing with long-term care, dealing with chronic illnesses that more minorities have like diabetes, like sickle cell, so and COPD. And we looked at also the jails and the prisons as far as healthcare. What were some of those disparities and going on? 
So in that meeting, you're going to hear us talking about, okay, we need more healthy foods in our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. We need to address this obesity issue. Mm -hmm. We heard from hospitals during COVID that 60% of the people that came in that had to be admitted to a hospital were obese. Mm -hmm. So that is a big concern that we are not working on obesity, which coincides with tobacco use, which coincide with the lack of healthy foods in our neighborhoods. So until we address some of these underlying issues, which caused the disparities in the first place, mm -hmm. we're not going to be able to decrease the disparities. So we're going to have to put more funding in those chronic illnesses, more resources in helping minorities in our health situation out. Mike? Well, and, and I'm going to piggyback on what Representative Shackford said. You know, resources in the minority uh, neighborhoods is very uh, essential. Uh, in the Latino community, for example, diabetes is, is the biggest thing. Diabetes is the biggest cause of people uh, uh, passing away. You know, people dying of diabetes. My grandma at the age of 52 years of age from my dad's side passed away from diabetes at a very young age. Yeah. I barely got to know her. And my grandma from my mom's side passed away at the age of 56, I think, from diabetes. My mom has diabetes. One of my brothers has diabetes. And so it's very prominent in the Latino community. But one of the issues is uh, a lot of times they cannot afford buying organic, like a lot of these right. uh, other communities are able to whole foods, you know, these uh, healthy uh, vitamins and all these other products that they're able to do to maintain their body. A uh, gym, a lot of these uh, 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 urban, like I grew up in the city, you know, communities don't have a gym where you can go in there and then the gym prescription is so expensive. Right. So they cannot afford it. But then you go to the higher ends of the communities and they have a nice gym and they can afford it. And um, now some of the things that, you know, we need more funding to help out and start educating our people at a younger age to be able to eat healthier. But we also need the resources to educate them, the resources, the tools to give them so they could be able to stay healthy. Um, and so uh, I am ecstatic once again that I'll be able to have the opportunity, first God willing, we get elected to work along Representative Shackerford and other people like-minded down in the legislation, as colleagues said, we could be able to work together and put a plan together to help our communities with these type of issues. And both of you are saying something that, that I think we're, you know, that we're kind of glossing over that we, we need to hit, right? Um, uh, uh, Republicans in the state of Indiana often talk about how they want to attract businesses. They do everything they can to reduce, um, taxes. They give tax abatements, tax incentives, everything they can to attract businesses, but they're attracting low wage businesses. They refuse to look at our minimum wage standards. It's, it's the same as it was, you know, in the nineties, but the cost of living continues to rise. Um, they're doing everything they can to bust up unions with right to work bill laws and construct common construction wage laws and things like that, that, uh, make it more difficult for people to, to organize and collective bargain. Uh, so how, if, even if a person is trying to bring themselves up, we're not even addressing the fact that we got a wage problem in the state of Indiana. If they're, and, I, and I never understood that because if you're trying to attract businesses, you know, you got to make sure that the people, when they come, they're going to have a quality of life, you know, that, that, that the families can enjoy. Talk about what we need to do to address this wage issue here in Indiana. So I will touch on that. We definitely have to raise the minimum wage. The minimum wage, it doesn't even cover a two-bedroom apartment average rent in any of our cities. Not so one. If you're a family of four and you're on minimum wage, most likely you're working two or three jobs. There is no way you could just work one job and be able to support, let alone yourself, let alone a whole family on minimum wage. So I, I think they need to just rename it because it's not, it's minimum, but it's nothing you can live off of by any means. We definitely need to start paying a livable wage. Everything is increasing from healthcare mm -hmm. to groceries, to your utilities. The utilities companies are asking for money. Everybody is asking for all this money and that puts more pressure on somebody that's not making enough. And then for our essential workers who had to work through COVID, who have to be out here before the public, all of them were, wasn't making a livable wage, but they're going out here risking their lives, making sure they're on the front lines, but yet we don't want to pay them where they can actually be able to support their families. But we want them to be out there and jeopardize their health 
jeopardize their family health so we can have their services. I think this is another one of those hypocritical moments with the Republicans and the establishment saying, thinking someone can live off the minimum wage and won't even think about raising the minimum wage. What we bring it up every year in the House, we bring it up every year in the Senate, they don't even want to hear it. They're not going to hear it. But the math does not make sense. And I think now we're getting to a point where the employers, where the businesses are saying, okay, we actually can't find people to work in certain areas, whether if there's a lack of training, whether if you're not paying enough, now you're hearing them be more vocal and say, we need to do something because either we're going to have to increase what we're paying people or it's just not matching. It's not working. They're going to, we're at some point, we're going to have to increase what people actually get paid. People at the bottom. Exactly. We ain't going to increase the people at the top. They They're doing just fine. The bottom that we need to increase their pay. Mike? And, you know, one of the biggest issues that people don't understand is people that are not able to have a good quality of life. And I go back to my situation uh, growing up because of the poverty that I grew up in. And, you know, not being able to raise the minimum wage hurts. I'll give an example, a single mother who's got two, three kids and she's got to work two, three jobs because she's essential to her job. Mm -hmm. But then she's got the burden of having to take care of the uh, child care. So she's not able to afford, you know, paying for child care. So now, you know, she's got that burden above being a single mom and having to just make ends meet to have a two bedroom apartment for the kids and to be able to take care of their needs. And so it's a ripple effect that people don't understand that. And then we blame society and why are kids not growing up with how the respect and moral values and why is this happening in our society is because the parents are not being able to spend enough time with their children to be able to love on them and care for them and show the compassion that they truly can give them because they're too busy working and the kids are at a child care. You know, they go from school to a child care, so they never get to see the parents. And on the weekends, the mom is working a weekend job being a waitress. Right, right. So we definitely need to raise the minimum wage because it's hurting the quality of life, it's hurting our next generation, and it's taking it away from being able to spend a quality time with their family or their mom or their dad who's looking to, uh, you know, work a job. Or some of these kids at a young age are working out there also trying to hustle like I do. Wow. And so it's, it's on call for that we're in 2020, we're still talking about this. And what drives me nuts, like people talk about, you know, well, if you, you know, they want to make it come down to personal choices. But see, here's the deal. Y- y'all want to make it about personal choices, but when you sitting in your office, you still want somebody else to come in and clean the, the restrooms. You still want somebody else to come in and dump your trash can. So, I mean, cause, cause y'all, you know, they too good to empty their own trash can and they too good. They don't want to clean public restrooms, but so, so they trying to blame people and try to shame people for doing, providing a service that they don't even want to do themselves. Exactly. And these are jobs that back in the day, these were crucial jobs. These are still crucial jobs to our economy. We still need every essential worker. We need every bus driver. We need people working at restaurants, working in the grocery stores. So these are jobs that we as society, we know we need these people to work in these jobs. But don't say it's someone's personal choice, like, oh, well, you got other options. You didn't have to work there. They do have to work there. For a lot of them, this is the only job they can find. And we don't even want to get started on ex-offenders getting just ostracized and can't find employment or transportation issues, daycare issues. There's so much that goes into looking for a job. And when you're trying to juggle two or three jobs, making sure the schedules work out, or if you miss over here too much, you get let go from that job, then those um, bad records are following you. So it's hard. Living in this world is hard when you're not making a certain amount and trying to juggle and make all these decisions, let alone then trying to take care of your kids and go to their meetings in school and trying to make it to these things. I think they don't, when you're sitting in the legislature, I really think they are so far removed from someone's everyday life. I don't think they truly know like how much things cost, how it's affecting people, the pressure and the stress that is putting on people when they can't supply things for their kids 
and how tired people are when they have to work two and three jobs. So wait, wait, you mean to tell me these Republic Indiana Hoosier Republicans, we ain't talking about people in DC, right? We talking about people who live in Munster. We're, talk, we're talking about people that live in Montgomery County. They so high on the hog. They don't even know what it's like to struggle. They, 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 what are some of the arguments that you hear uh, in that state house against raising the minimum wage? I want to know what they're saying. I'm speculating. You're actually in there making the fight. Yeah, they're on the business owner side. The business owners are saying they can't afford it. So you constantly got the business owners over here saying we can't afford to pay anything above $15 or above. If we do, it's going to break into our profit. So when they're listening to the Indiana Chamber, when they're listening to those businesses who don't want to budge, then they side with them. Besides siding with the people who are saying we can't live off this $7 and something an hour, there's no way, and we're having multiple jobs. So I'm going to need the Republicans to scoot over here (laughs) with the community, with the people, and less on the business side when it comes to this livable wage issue. Especially since the people sent them to office, didn't they, Mike? It wasn't the businesses that elected them, it was the people. That is true, and that's why I think that, you know, as I go around as a first time we're running for office and I am canvassing every day, meeting and engaging with the community, talking to them so they can get to know me. I have that balance because I grew up in poverty. I know what it means to go through suffering and pain and, uh, and just having to miss a lot of the normal stuff that other kids do nowadays, like sports. Um, you know, I was able to play some type of sports, but I had to work at a young age, so I couldn't be on a soccer team. I couldn't, you know, I was at, I went to a school that was so poor that we didn't even have a soccer team, put it that way. And now I've been blessed to work so hard that God has given me the ability to be my own business owner. And now I'm a small business owner myself. So I know how to be able to balance both to say, hey, you can hire, you can pay people good quality job. I always tell this to people, you pay for what you get, right? Ain't that it. So if you pay good quality, you're going to get quality in return. It's about employee morale. If you, t- if you treat your employees right, if you take care of them, they're going to perform. If you treat them wrong, they're not going to perform like you want to. So you as a business owner have to understand what I would like to say, you know, you have to have compassion and you also have to learn how to be a good leader and mix them both and be able to know how to take care of people. And in return, those people are going to be able to work good for you and you're going to make your money regardless. Because if you do good quality work and you hire good quality people and you take care of them, and pay them a quality wage, you're going to be able to be successful. Well, I think is what it comes down to. And I'm going to be just very honest. What it comes down to is greed. You have a lot of people who are greedy, and they want to have the nicest BMW, the next Rolls Royce, you know, the next bigger 10,000 square feet home, and they don't care about the people that work for them. So and apparently, so what it comes down to it, it's about money. Yeah. You know? They're listening and, and, to the wrong business owner because you just sat there saying you own two businesses. You're a business owner, and you recognize the value of taking care of your employees. And I can say, hey, you can be a successful business owner, and you can't take care of people because guess what? I'm doing it. And so that's how I'm engaged in the community and say, look, I understand both sides, and I understand that we could work together. We could get things accomplished, and we could take care of people. And at the end of the day, it would be a better world if we all knew how to love each other, work with each other, and show compassion. Absolutely. Go ahead, Robin. I want to expand on what Mike was saying because we have minority businesses paying $15 an hour, Mm. not paying minimum wage, and they're doing it just like he he is. I would love to see a coalition of businesses that are paying at least $10 or $15 an hour, a list of those, and then shame the ones that don't want to see that minimum wage increase and say they can't increase it. Because when you look at the industries that they're representing, they're making billions. Their profits are in the billions and millions. So why can't you increase, if a small minority company can pay someone $15 an hour, then why can't you as a franchisee, as a corporation, why can't you pay at least $15 an hour? I think think Mike hit it on the head. He said it's all about greed. You know, we've gotten to this point. I mean, everybody knows the the line from Wall Street. 
Greed is good. But no, greed is not good. It's one of the seven deadly sins. And I don't know why anybody ain't really said that before. But that's why we we find ourselves in the state that we're in. Because, you know, one of the other things that uh, income disparity uh, has an impact on is our environment. Um, we know that Indiana is 48th in the nation, and we uh, we might even be worse now. I don't even know. I haven't even looked in the last couple couple of months. But we're 48th in the nation when it comes to air quality. Um, and 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 you got 45 talking about he want to open up coal again, and even the coal companies are saying, "No, nah, we're not going that route." Indiana is not making the investment in renewable energies, and the, it's the 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 lower income, the the struggling communities that are that, that take the brunt of these these raggedy environmental rules. You know what? And it's so, in Martin Del Brightwood, a couple of years ago, we had to have the EPA come in to uh, turn over land in all these houses. It not only was in Martin Del Brightwood, it was also in Lake County. But we have these companies that are not doing what they're supposed to do. They're leaving behind all this uh, contaminated land, contaminated spaces in our community. And they'll come in and they'll dig it up every so often because it starts to rise back up to the top. Mm -hmm. And this was the second time the EPA has been in. And we're not holding the corporations liable. Actually, the EPA paid for that cleanup. But they're like, it's kind of hard to find the company because the company's gone out of business. But we need to hold them liable while they're in business. We know they're putting out pollutants, contaminations that's affecting the health of our kids that's affecting the health of our workers. So when it comes to environment, I think it's one of those things one more time again, where we're letting these businesses escape after they have contaminated these areas and then trying to figure out who's gonna pay for the cleanup. Mike? I agree. And you know, what it comes down to is that a lot of this contaminations unfortunately happens in um, areas that are, you know, the minority people live in. Course. And so, of course, uh, the attention is not focused there because, um, you know, we, we don't have a voice and we don't have a seat on the table. And so uh, we need more of that. You know, we need to be able to say, hey, it's not right. You know, let's clean up this mess. There's no reason to, like Representative Shackelford said, for us to have these type of landfills where they just create in a, better, a worse environment. And, uh, and, our, and it's not only ourselves, but also... I go back to our children, our next generation. They're also going to feel this repercussions of people not caring for them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we need to do something about it. You know, you could tell how bad it is already as it is. And it's not an open eyes. I mean, you see what's going on in the West Coast with all these wildfires over there. And a person still decides not to take action, still decides to deal with their carelessness, still decides not to deal with it at all. Because to him, it's not his problem, right? right? I bet you Trump Towers were burning down. He will be doing some damn, damn thing about it. But because he's not doing some damn thing about it, because not Trump Towers, he doesn't give an F about it. So we need to say, hey, enough is enough. We're going to take initiative. We as leaders are going to put pressure and say we need to care for our generation and our next generation to come because enough is enough. And what's killer, y'all, I mean, forget about Trump. You know, it ain't like Governor Holcomb is a free-thinking governor. You know, it ain't like he knows how to to make a ruling and then stick with it. Oh, but by the way, you know, former Governor Mike Pence come in town, give his order, and Governor uh, Holcomb changes his mind. I mean, Mike Pence, listen, we just got to talk about people working two jobs. I really don't think Mike Pence needs to have two jobs. He don't need to be the vice president of the United States and the governor of the state of Indiana. But, But Governor Holcomb ain't no better. I mean, this guy's a minion if I ain't never seen one. Well, you know what, Dana, we asked the governor, the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus has sat down with the governor. We done asked him to do about four executive orders that will help with what's going on right now with the protests, with the criminal justice system. One was a simple one, just establishing a criminal justice commission so we can look at all this and work on these issues. But of course, the other ones was like banning chokeholds things that he can do since we're not in session, but he did not commit to doing not one of them. He is, I don't even know where he is on these, but these were simple things that he could have done to help out with our justice and criminal justice system. As you see, we're in a national light. You see everything that's going on 
and that our system needs to be fixed just like every other state too. But for him not willing to step up and to do some of the bare minimum items, I mean, we appreciate him establishing a chief equity officer, but that wasn't on nobody's demand list. (laughs) Anybody's demand list out of what all the protesters was demanding, whether it was Black Lives Matter, the African American Coalition, the IVLC, we did not have that on there. So I'm just needing him to listen to the people and take a stance. I, it seems like he wants to, but I really need him to take a stance, a firm stance on a lot of these issues. He doesn't want to take a firm stance on anything. He, he's, I mean, literally the scientist said, if you mandate masks, we can, you know, knock this thing down. He didn't take a stand on that. Mm-hmm. No. Mike, chime in here. Well, since we're talking about uh, Governor Holcomb, I want to uh, kind of change a little bit. Okay. We're still with the government race. But I want to say, Dr. Woody Myers, come on, I was uh, about to say, a phenomenal job, and he and I'm excited. We're going to work hard to make sure he does become our next governor. And uh, you know, he is a man that I've met several times. We've done several meeting greets with him together here in Northwest Indiana, and he is a man of compassion, very smart man, very smart man, uh, a man that knows how to work the aisle, a man that knows how to bring the drive and work ethic. You see him out there; he is everywhere. He is. Driving everywhere, him and his wife Stacy, phenomenal, phenomenal it's couple. Be a great first lady. And I am excited. I am excited uh, that hopefully first got willing November third, or you know if the if the numbers still have to be counted the next day, he'll be our next governor. But he will be able to cross that aisle, work with everybody, make a difference in our state, and uh, and allow us to have a voice that we desperately need here. So I, I shifted from from that a little bit no, 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 to no, say. Uh, Dr. Woody Myers and Stacy, yeah. we are pushing for you. We are working hard for you. And, uh, of course, uh, Lieutenant Governor Linda Lawson, uh, who's running with him. Uh, what a duel. What a great team, both of them. Lawson and Woody, they make a great combination. Uh, they bring the force. And uh, I'm excited for that. So I know I deviated from that because that's I wanted right. to give them a plug. We're a party, baby. Really We're a leader, party. Yeah, we need good leadership, and that's what we need here in our state. We, we support everybody. I love it because I've done like four interviews with Dr. Woody Myers myself. I, I love talking to him. But you know what? The other thing that I'm hearing uh, in these conversations, see, that's why I like having organic conversations because, you know, we're hitting on so many things and this hour is almost over already. Um, what I'm hearing is we have a bunch of elected officials, but we have very few elected leaders. We need, we need people that are not afraid to stand up and be leaders and make sound decisions. Mike, tell us, what do you possess within yourself to be a good leader for the state of Indiana? I'm glad you mentioned that because I actually get that brought up a lot as I'm knocking at people's doors and I'm going to tell you what I tell everybody. Hi, I am Mike Andrade. I am running as your next state representative for District 12 and I am working hard for you. And here's the qualities that I bring as a leader to make a difference in our community. Number one, I bring work ethic. I'm going to roll my sleeve and I'm going to work hard for you. I'm going to put people over power and politics. That is one of the characteristics, attributes that my dad taught me at a young age. And that's one of the many reasons I've been successful now as a business owner. So then I shift my work ethic to also being a small business owner. And I be able to have what is called fiscal responsibility, know when to give resources and when not to. I also know how to work as a team. You have to be able to work as a team You'll be able to find common ground. You know, you have to be able to, uh, and especially in my district that is very diversified, to be able to know how to collaborate to get things accomplished. And I, as a leader, will be able to bring that to the table where I'll be able to listen to people, their concerns, our constituents' needs, and be able to take action. And like you said, have a voice. Not be afraid to speak because that's what I'm getting voted to do. I'm being voted to be the next state rep and be the best representative that I could be for my district downstate and bring those resources back. And I'm going to work hard for you. Thank you. Man, I would cast a vote for you, but I got great Porter. I'm happy. Robin, (laughs) I already know that you're a leader. You are, aren't you like the, the chair president of the, uh, the legislative black caucus? So yeah, I'm the chair of black legislative caucus. I'm the vice chair of our women's power caucus. 
and then the ranking minority member on the health committee. But I will say some of those things um, that I make sure I highlight on top of everything that Mike just said is bringing new ideas. Mm -hmm. We need new, fresh ideas to the legislature. We have new problems, old problems, but some of these problems we're addressing with the same train of thought. Mm -hmm. so someone there, different train of thought and a new train of thought, and then bringing young people, collaborating with people from the community, young people, getting them involved in the resolution process. They want to be involved. We need their ideas. So making sure we bring them along and then not putting out empty promises. Okay. Talking follow through. We have too many elected officials just talking, putting out empty promises with no follow through. So I'm a person that if I promise, I'm going to follow through on it and make it happen. So I would say those are three top things that you can guarantee that I'll continue to do. Well, and the other thing that, that you guys do, um, especially the, the Black Caucus, and, I'm a, I, and I, I love this. You guys, after the session is over, y'all go as a group to different sections of our state and talk to the communities about the things that happened in the session, things that you're working on, like your, your justice um, uh, platform. Talk about how you guys came about with the plan of, of taking as a group, going around the state, um, sharing the information with communities that normally wouldn't probably hear what was going on, and then the focus on the justice, um, the, the criminal justice reform. So we started that about four or five years ago, going around during the summer and doing the town halls because we wanted to take the state house to the communities, to the people. We knew everyone didn't have a black legislator in their city. We're only in Marion County and Lake County right now. We did have one rep in South Bend who left us, so we miss him dearly. <laughs> but we're only representing two counties. Wow. So for the other counties and the other cities, they need to know wow. what was taking place in the state house, and we need to get their feedback. So that's why we started going on the road and going out to these different uh, cities and talking to them. The other thing was this year, because of COVID, mm -hmm. we couldn't go out, but we held two virtual town halls. They had over 15,000 people participate virtually, which is way more than we ever would have got if we would have went out face-to-face. Uh, -face. So we are excited that this year we did not have to back down and cancel it, that we were able to still impact just as many people across the state. And we took that input and started to work on our justice reform agenda. From the two town halls, talking to different people, stakeholders, we developed a lengthy justice reform agenda that included saving lives, that included transparency, that included empowering our community. So we divided up all these bills that we came up with. So you'll see each legislator is going to work on about three or four bills, which came out of that agenda. We push in this all together. Before session starts, we always put out a Black Caucus legislative agenda. So that's affecting minority communities. So this will definitely be our agenda as we go into session. But I think everyone has been happy or excited to see this agenda together. Everybody is excited about how can they participate come session? How can they advocate? We will be doing two advocacy boot camps after the uh, election. So come November and December, okay. because now we want to teach people how to actually advocate at the state house what you need to do, how you need to do it, when you need to do it. So you'll see that coming from the IBLC soon. I hope y'all let me broadcast that. I, I mean, turn left could, you know, I would love to share that with my listeners. I would love to do that. Y'all, yep. uh, yeah, I mean, what you know, whatever, you know, and it's going to be great because Mike's going to be on your team too um, come, come next year and, and he's going to be right there because I know uh, Mara – also caucus with the black caucus. So I know, but again, like you said, we all in this thing together, baby. And if you're looking, you said minority communities, you didn't just say black communities, but I am going to like call out like Allen County. What you mean? We ain't got no black folks in the state house from Allen County to where, which has Fort Wayne, the second largest city in our state. What do you mean? South, uh, uh St. Joe County don't have any black legislators. What do you mean? Vandenberg? What do you mean? Come on. These, I'm not talking about the small towns or the rural counties. I'm talking about counties that have significant minority populations. What you mean? I think it's time for our party to work a little harder and make sure that we're recruiting more minority candidates in those counties. Yep, I said it. Say it again. <laughs> yep, I said it. I don't, 
I got also, I mean, we're trying to recruit, but we're just 13 people. Yeah. So we, the power of the party behind us is trying to recruit minorities where we have a large population of minorities in these other larger cities. Yes. No reason we should not have minority representation in some of these other cities. At least not in Fort, I mean, in Fort Wayne? Come on, it's the second largest city in the state. The fact that, uh, all right, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let it go because now it, you, you didn't got me hype. Now I'm hype. Y'all, we didn't even get a chance to talk. This this was the, an amazing conversation. The two of you together, like, yo, y'all like the truth, man. Uh, I'm excited about uh, what you guys are going to accomplish uh, when you guys get to that state house. You guys are amazing. Mike, tell the people where they can find you so they can donate to your campaign, they can volunteer, but more importantly, help you get votes. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity uh, that allow me to be part of this. It's amazing. It's always great to meet good people and be able to collaborate and work with good people. I'm actually excited. I like to say that at work because I am. Uh, and I'm looking forward to in the future to working with Representative Shackelford and the Black Caucus and be a part of it as well downstate and, uh, and continue for us to be able to work together. And Dana, thank you for being a voice, a voice that we desperately need in our state. And I'm looking forward, Dana, you need to come to Lake County over here and we got to do collaborate and do something together over here, Dana. Just so, hey, let's get uh, it on the calendar, man. I've been dying to yeah. get up to Lake County. I've been reaching out to Senator Melton. I've been reaching out to the NAACP up there. I am so ready to do some stuff in Lake County because, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm changing the subject, but I get hyped about Lake County because. Well, they, you know what, Dana? You can ride with me up to Gary this Saturday. I'll drive. This Saturday. The IBLC is having their voter oh. outreach in East Chicago and Gary. And right now I ain't got nobody to ride with me. So I'm going I to can't. I got my power of the black and brown vote. Because I, I asked us, uh, Representative Harris, if he could sit in on it. He's like, I got an event. So, but that's okay. We know we got to, ooh, I can't wait. Because see, Lake County is where the fire is at. And the other thing is, the re one of the reasons why I want us as a party, as deputy chair for engagement, I want us to be in Lake County because... We already saw in 2008 how powerful um, Lake County is. And I hate that Lake County, and, and Lake County and Vandenberg County especially, they feel like they feel like they're disconnected from our state. And I'm even going to say Clark County. They feel disconnected from our state. And I think it's up to us. It's incumbent on us as party leaders. And I don't even know if I'm a leader. I'm just a big mouth. You a leader. It's it's up to us to like be in those spaces to let those folks know that our party is here and we are work. Oh, thank you, Mike. I'm coming. I'm coming. You, I love it. You ain't gonna ask me twice. I'm coming. We gonna hype the folk up up in Lake County. I love Lake. I've been to Laporte Porter. I I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. Did you tell all the people where no, you? No, you're fine. <laughs> I got excited. W W W Andrade A N D R A D E 2020.com. That's my website, www.andrade2020.com. In there, you can know about my platform, all the endorsement that we received from the party and from the unions and from the working families. And there's a link there that you could donate that would take you to our Act Blue, where you can securely donate with a credit card. If you would like to mail us a check, uh, you could send it to our PO box, which you could write a check to citizens for Mike Andrade, P.O. Box 3279, Munster, M-U-N-S-T-E-R, Munster, Indiana, zip code 46321. Please follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Mike Andrade for Indiana State Representative District 12. You can find us there on Facebook. And uh, I'm excited for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dana, for being a voice. And I look forward to seeing you hopefully soon. Representative Shackleford, you thank you as always week. for being very gracious. And we appreciate your leadership within the caucus, uh, within the House, but also with us as minorities. Thank you so much. I'm going to see you next week, Mike. Quit playing. On the 13th. or Yeah. On the 13th when we do uh, um, our uh, 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 the Latino Caucus Candidate Forum. I don't, I'm don't. i not even sure what I'm calling it, but you know you're going to see me on October 13th. Quit playing. Quit playing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, his donate button is you. If you're not really sure, you didn't catch it all. Don't worry about it. His donate button is right there. Click on it. His donate button is right there, or it's right there. All right, Robin, tell the people where they can find you. So, shopping for for house, you can go to at Blue to donate. But more importantly, me and Representative Pryor 
Every other year, we have a fundraiser for our birthdays, and we are turning 50 this year. Hey! Good year. Big, yes, a big 50th birthday in the park cookout October the 17th at Northwest Lake Park from 12 to 3. So come on by, come and talk to us, hang out with some other Democrats. That'll be the best way if you want to come in person and donate or hang out with us or just go to Act Blue uh, for the Shaka Four for House. But I am just excited that I finally got to come to Dana's show <laughs> and finally got to be in the big league. So oh, thank stop. you, Dana. Uh, and I'm gonna follow up to see if you want to ride with me to Gary on Saturday. I can't go this Saturday. I got I got to do my thing. I got to do my thing because we you know we've been okay. planning this out because we really want to talk about you know the joint effort that we have to have um, in our black and brown communities to make sure that you know because there's more of us when we when we work together, right? The mm-hmm. one thing about politics and everybody know well a lot of people don't know you got to be able to count your votes. You get yeah. before you can do anything else. How many votes can you get? And you know what? If we work together as black and brown and all of our other minority com- communities, if we come marginalized communities, um, we come together, uh, we can we can be a powerful voice. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm talking about the LGBTQ plus folk. I'm talking about our Asian community. We just need to bring everybody together. And you know what? We can we can string together some some wins. You know what I'm saying? But we you know and yes, then we can once we start winning. Then we can start addressing like the individual needs, right? You can't really until you get representation in there. You guys are in there fighting tooth and nail, you know, for wage increases, criminal justice reform, and they're not even listening to you because they got that silly supermajority. But we got to get some numbers in there. We got to be able to count, and so that's why. So I can't go this Saturday, but you're gonna see me October seventeenth because I turned fifty this year too. Oh, okay. Yes, I turned fifty in June. And I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, you know, 70 was a very good year. So <laughs> y'all, y'all were great. I can literally sit and talk to you two all day long. I mean, this was a fun, fun, fun conversation. Thank you so much for joining us on Turn Left. Robin, keep working hard. I know you've been putting in the, in the work. Mike, I can't see, I can't wait to see what you're going to do, but I am going to see you on October 13th so we can talk again with your uh, Latino Caucus crew. I'm excited about that. Ah, uh, God, are y'all not excited? Oh, my God. We just well, lifted so everybody I, I, up I, I, from Tuesday. Yeah, I'm excited. Mike will be joining us, and we'll have another new member of IBLC, Renee Pat. Oh, I've already had Renee on. Yes, she's yeah. amazing. So we we growing it. We growing it. Y'all, I'm going to get out of here. Indiana's on Dana Black. Thank you so much for tuning in to Turn Left. Next week, guess who I got coming? Guess, guess, guess. Yes. The congressman that actually calls back goes back to his community and talks to his constituents. No, I'm not talking about Tennessee Trey Hollingsworth. <laughs> he never comes back. No, mm-mm. I'm not talking about Representative Greg Pence. He ain't showing up. Even even Susan Brooks, who's retiring, she didn't come back and talk to the people. But <laughs> Representative Congressman Andre Carson makes his way back to Indianapolis as often as he can when he is not in session, and he will be joining us next week, just me and him. We're going to chop it up. I get We get to talk about the things that are really going on. So next week, we got our congressman, Andre Carson. Whew, I get excited. I get excited when it's the congressman. So make sure you tune in next week. Indiana's on. Turn left. Thank you so much. I'll holler at y'all next week. Peace.